I'm so happy you're here. Whilst I pick up my cue cards, can we just do a quick call? Who is a who knows the br uh, brand Bondi Sands? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> You've just upped my brand awareness. Thank you. <laughs> who's a Bondi Sands customer who's bought Bondi Sands products? Even better. There you are. There's a lot of hands going up. <laughs> Okay, so Karen first spoke on, at DTC Live, I think at our very first conference two years ago. Indeed. Karen, you're the, well, do you want to, I'll let you introduce yourself. But since then, Karen has been through an absolutely incredible journey. The numbers are behind her. Uh, Bondi Sands has been through a 450 million acquisition by the Kawa Group, which is, I always call the Jap Japan's Estee Lauder. Yeah, P&G of Japan, I would say. Okay, P&G <laughs> of Japan. And Karen has really led that from the UK team point of view. So Karen, do you want to tell us, start by telling us who you are and what you do? Hello, and thank you uh, for inviting me today to speak uh, again. Um, so I'm Karen King. I have been uh, with Bondi Sands for the last four and a bit years. Um, and I have been with uh, the brand on an amazing journey. Um, but for those of you that know the brand, it's 11 years old, so really not that old um, in the scheme of brands. Um, and I was initially brought on board um, four years ago when the UK team size was, I think I was employee number five. Um, and we have massively scaled during that time and pivoted the business from a distributor-led business um, across Europe um, into a direct business model in the UK, obviously build it, building out a fully cross-functional team. All of the things that have been talked about here today, finance, operations, supply chain, 3PLs, finance systems, all of those bits and pieces. And really, obviously, um, the European market's been one of the three driving uh, regions to, to help position the, the brand for ultimately for sale, which is... Um, I guess what my focus has been for the last 18 months or so um, from having kind of taken the brand. All of this happened during COVID, I'd say. I started two weeks before lockdown. So <laughs> it's been a really, uh, really interesting journey. And did you know at that point the plan was to take it through an acquisition of this scale? No, um, I knew that obviously the brand wanted to scale and that was the expectation um, in terms of growth. Um, I think if you're in a, on a journey, a high growth journey, um, Bondi Sands was a privately owned, privately funded um, company um, to scale and go to an in on, an, on the kind of scale that we have internationally. You need funding of some shape or form. Um, your pockets, uh, the pockets of our founders were only so deep. The bank uh, will only lend you so much money and you need stock if you want to scale and, and supply your products into new markets. So um, I knew at some point there were a number of routes for option. Obviously, you go to, you know, you look for a VC, you look for uh, some kind of funding from banks or otherwise, or you look for sale, whether that's complete sale or partial investment or otherwise from a company. Um, and I think I probably initially, like the very transparent conversations we ha I had with the founder was that that ne wasn't necessarily on the cards, but it became on the cards, I guess, at a certain point. Um, and at that point, then um, I guess the priorities of what you're looking for change a little bit in terms of what you're then trying to deliver um, in terms of back to the business. And um, when you're positioning for sale, there was obviously a certain shaped P&L you're really aiming to get towards um, to maximize that value um, at the point at which you're, uh, you're, you're positioning the brand in that way. I mean, we see obviously a lot of brands, a lot of different setups and structures and how they all operate. And I think one thing that stood out uh, about Bondi Sands and you since I've known you is your focus on delivering everything largely via an in-house team. Just tell us about how you've done that because at various points, Karen's had like influence departments. I mean, everything is under your remit, isn't it? Everything that would, some of which would often be outsourced. How have you done that? And how do you feel that resulted in the ultimate value realization? I think, um, and to be clear, we don't do everything in-house. We do use agencies as well for certain aspects, but I think, um, like the direction we took was to do what we know best ourselves. Um, it enables you to stay close to your consumer. You really know what's going on. Um, and your content creators, like Bondi is not that old. It's a digitally native brand. It was born in the area we were talking about earlier with influencers when they weren't on the size and scale and didn't um, involve the sums of money now that brands put behind um, getting great content out. Um, and I think... Enab that has enabled us to stay such close to our consumer and really make sure we're doing the right things to grow the brand. Um, and I think James mentioned earlier, like it's people, people, people. Like you can't grow brands. You can have a great product. You can have a great marketing strategy. But you also need fantastic people that have got your back and are really motivated towards driving towards the end result. And I think our founders have been extremely clear in what the growth objectives are and have motivated people to want to perform in that way as well. So um, that's very much been part of, I think, what's driven the success. And um, I know if they were here, like if Sean or Blair were sitting here today, they'd tell you, 
you need a great team of people to to do that and we've scaled that as we've grown and, and brought in I guess a real mixture of experience we've got people that are young that get the influence get the digital marketing really understand our customers but we've also as we scaled brought in the right people with um, you know I guess more blue chip type experience who've worked in bigger companies that that can understand processes and bring structure and um, and kind of um, manage that balance hopefully as well as you can. Okay, and it's really easy when you see a big number like the one on the screen and hear Karen's, what Karen's saying, you think, oh, that all sounds totally amazing, while skipping over the slightly more tedious parts of the due diligence process and the integration process, both of which I know have almost consumed your... your My when, entire life. Okay, I was going to say her waking hours, but your entire life. What is the due diligence process like for an organisation like... Uh, you know, the cow group acquiring I, I think if I was to roll back 12 months ago when I kind of knew this was beginning to happen and I was put under NDA to be part of the due diligence response team for the um, for the purchasing company, um, I would have thought, well, gosh, not that simple. You know, you agree a price, blah, blah, blah. But actually, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So anyone that's looking to sell their business, that would be my, um, you know, thing is it doesn't happen overnight. There's actually a huge amount of work that goes into the pitch, the preparation. They're looking for trajectories. It's not just about one year's results. They're looking for that story. What's actually happening? What's the future potential? What's the value and what's the worth of the people, the brand? Where, where are you going and how are you going to unlock that growth? So I think, um, you know, there's it, that process started um, probably yeah, about a year ago, actually, or maybe a little bit more than that ago. And the deal completed in November. Um, so and if anyone that has um, I've had a bit of a cultural induction to Japanese in the last uh, <laughs> in the last 12 months as well. They're extremely detailed. So probably um, I would liken my experience to the last 12 months, and particularly when you're the only person in the business here that knows this is happening in the background. Um, being part of that response team and things coming in overnight or every morning, I'd wait up to a set of questions and, you know, explain what happened in April 2020 to the EPOS in Boots in this particular. And you're thinking about God, you know, like, that it felt like being back at university or at school asking that level of detail because they were testing whether we knew our business and what was going on, I guess. Um, so the due diligence process and, you know, I'm sure a company doesn't part with that kind of money for a brand um, if they haven't done their due diligence really well. I hope so. not. Yeah, one would hope not, yeah. So I think that the due diligence process was extremely thorough um, and was very time-consuming. And actually, that's probably been one of the biggest challenges in the last 12 months and actually will be also the challenge of the next 12 months is you're doing all of this stuff and preparing to sell and I'm now on the pivot doing all of the integration on the other side of the hump, if that's the right way of, uh, of putting it. But you're doing that alongside your day job. The business is still expecting you to deliver back your results, your P&L, your growth. Um, etc. So it's really that's been the challenge of the last 12 months balancing that kind of due diligence um, and response and now balancing doing the day job and keeping my team motivated and um, continuing to grow but also balancing that integration piece now as well. And integration is integrating the people, integrating the IP, what, what's involved in it? Oh so much more than I'd ever anticipated. <laughs> um, so they migrated our IT over the weekend so you know shit, everything's moved in the background, systems, logins, IT, all our computers have changed, um, you know ev everything, um, people obviously that's big piece so we moved our team into the cow offices um that's a cultural difference coming from a startup where you kind of we're used to our small little environment where everyone knows everyone suddenly we're in you know we're 100 people in a 35,000 people employed company I guess not that many people in London maybe 250 but you know it's a very different environment to be in um and navigating and keeping a team I guess on board for that journey which can feel quite scary and quite different from maybe what some of their experiences have been before um, it's a challenge and we're still we're going to be on this journey I'm under no uh, disillusion like SAP go live is meant to be the first of October we'll see um but you know there's a whole host of things that have got to happen now in the background to to get us fully integrated onto the same finance system same 3PL warehousing um yeah all of those things it's really complex I've realized that I'm yeah the journey's not over yet <laughs> it was just starting <laughs> so the Carl Group own a number of brands that people will know what are they what are the ones that John Frieda yeah, so um, I don't. Who's heard of Cow? This was like when the first when they told me They're Cow, I was like, becoming Cow, more who? well known. Yeah. They are definitely becoming more. Yeah, well I hope known. so. And I think that's obviously one of part of like. I mean, they're incredibly well known. What I mean is more well known in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. They're well known globally, yeah. and they are a big company. But the brands that you guys will probably know are John Frieda, um, which is the number four um, mass, mass um, hair care brand in the UK. Molten Brown, um, Curel, which is a Japanese skincare brand. Biore, uh, also a skincare a Japanese skincare brand. 
um, and also we have a salon division which has KMS, Goldwell, some of the brands that you'll see and maybe your hairdressers that you visit. So they do own quite a few brands. And, they're, they're, and, and it's not exactly just, a, they're hoping that your team can bring something into their portfolio as well, aren't they? Yeah, I definitely, um, I hope so. And that's my experience so far. They definitely, you know, they've bought us as a brand to fuel their winning skin strategy, which um, is really exciting. And I think there's lots of things we will take from um, being part. And I'm actually really pleased we've been acquired by a company that's got such great experience in manufacturing, raw ingredients, purchasing, procurement, all of those things, which we, you know, as a smaller company, you haven't got the heavy weight to be able to do that. So though all of those things will come through as cost savings in our P&L in due course. But I think on the flip of it, we know... And it's been really great for my team to experience the other the other way around. You know, I'm, I'm now looking after the other consumer care brands in the UK as well as Bondi Sands. And it's been great listening to the John Frieda team asking the Bondi team, tell us what you do on influencers. Like, how, how does this work? And when I look at how... Um, you know, the media mix of what we're using to reach customers is really different. And I think there's lots of shared learnings. We're probably, we operate in a completely different way, which is going to be challenging at points, I think, but it's also going to be really interesting. I think there's a huge learning opportunities on both sides for the Bondi Sands team to learn from Cal, um, the Cal employees, and likewise the Cal brands to kind of understand, um, you know, a brand that doesn't spend anything in kind of TV advertising and um, is really digitally, digitally led. The spend models are very different. Okay, so given your experience over the last 12 months and the next God knows how many months to come, what advice would you give people in the room in terms of things like acquisition discussions, due diligence processes, you know, just the amount of time these types of things take at that scale, but at a much smaller scale too? Yeah. I think like preparation, like anything, is, is key. So you need to know what you're going for. Um, and you need to make sure you're resourced to be able to manage it as well. Because as I've said, like it's... It's not anyone that's selling or buying a business. There's a lot of questions that are asked and you need to be able to balance that alongside the day job. So I think, you know, the preparation work we probably did in the preceding three years to have a great team have allowed me to pivot and focus my energies on that for the founders. Um, and on the flip, the, my team have managed to keep the, the brand moving in the direction that we've wanted to to deliver the business results. So I think you have to build your team and your um uh, team before you can probably be in that position. I was about to ask you how you've managed to do the day job and be dealing with this whilst nobody knew. I mean, that must have been very stressful. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't know. You just get when you're in that moment, you just get on with it, and that's how it is. I'm sure my team now were wondering why the hell I'm not an expert on everything. You know, I, where I was saying, oh, yeah, please, can you share the, <laughs> this information or <laughs> provide me with that because I didn't know necessarily all of the nitty gritty answers to be able to respond to. Um, you know, in hindsight, I'm sure, you know, people began to think there was, you know, like something going on in the background as, as often the case, but it's, you know, it's a public list listed company, so it didn't need to stay completely confidential. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think luckily, maybe, I don't know, anyone else got experience of, of acquisitions? Maybe, I think I've been told actually ours was relatively quick for six months for such a big amount and for such a big company. Um, I mean, there's definitely people in the room with experience. Is six months quick? I'm looking at you, yeah. Yeah. So I think like the initial conversations were February last year and, the, and and actually the last bit, we had this really weird dull period, which was we knew the deal was going to happen. It was announced to, um, to the stock exchange in Tokyo in August. Um, and then we had three months of the Australian government doing their regulatory uh, due diligence, which took a very, very long time. So actually we had this weird period where we knew it was kind of going to happen, but <laughs> couldn't happen. And we were still holding our cards close to the chest, trying to begin to plan things. But without necessarily being able to do all of that at that level of detail. So, um, yeah, I guess maybe I'm saved by the fact it was a relatively short time time period. But it's been really interesting. It must have been super interesting, Karen. Well done. And I think huge congratulations to you for steering the UK team and, and the work you did on that. It's amazing. So thank you, Karen. Thanks so much. You thank you very much. At the end for questions. I'm sure people will have some to ask you. Thank you.